The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas. The Author's Preface. In which it is proved that, notwithstanding their names ending in OS and IS, the heroes of the story which we are about to have the honor to relate to our readers have nothing mythological about them. A short time ago, while making researches in the Royal Library for my history of Louis the Fourteenth, I stumbled by chance upon the memoirs of Monsieur d'Artagnan, printed, as were most of the works of that period in which authors could not tell the truth without the risk of a residence more or less long in the Bastille, at Amsterdam by Pierre Rouge. The title attracted me. I took them home with me, with the permission of the guardian, and devoured them. It is not my intention here to enter into an analysis of this curious work, and I shall satisfy myself with referring such of my readers as appreciate the pictures of the period to its pages. They will therein find portraits pencilled by the hand of a master, and although these squibs may be, for the most part, traced upon the doors of barracks and the walls of cabarets, they will not find the likenesses of Louis the Thirteenth, Anne of Austria, Richelieu, Mazarin, and the courtiers of the period, less faithful than in the history of Monsieur Anquety. But it is well known, what strikes the capricious mind of the poet is not always what affects the mass of readers. Now, while admiring, as others doubtless will admire, the details we have to relate, our main preoccupation concerned a matter to which no one before ourselves had given a thought. D'Artagnan relates that on his first visit to Monsieur de Treville, captain of the King's Musketeers, he met in the antechamber three young men, serving in the illustrious corps into which he was soliciting the honor of being received bearing the names of Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. We must confess these three strange names struck us, and it immediately occurred to us that they were but pseudonyms under which D'Artagnan had disguised names, perhaps illustrious, or else that the bearers of these borrowed names had themselves chosen them on the day in which, from caprice, discontent, or want of fortune, they had donned the simple musketeer's uniform. From the moment we had no rest till we could find some trace in contemporary works of these extraordinary names which had so strongly awakened our curiosity. The catalogue alone of the books we read with this object would fill a whole chapter which, although it might be very instructive, would certainly afford our readers but little amusement. It will suffice, then, to tell them that at the moment at which discouraged by so many fruitless investigations, we were about to abandon our search, we at length found, guided by the counsels of our illustrious friend Paulin Paris, a manuscript in folio, endorsed 4,772, or 4,773, we do not recollect which, having for title, Memoirs of the Comte de la Fere, touching some events which passed in France toward the end of the reign of King Louis the Thirteenth, and the commencement of the reign of King Louis the Fourteenth, It may be easily imagined how great was our joy when, in turning over this manuscript, our last hope, we found at the twentieth page the name of Athos, at the twenty-seventh the name of Porthos, and at the thirty-first the name of Aramis. The discovery of a completely unknown manuscript at a period in which historical science is carried to such a high degree appeared almost miraculous. We hastened, therefore, to obtain permission to print it, with the view of presenting ourselves some day with the pack of others at the doors of the Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres. If we should not succeed, a very probable thing, by the by, in gaining admission to the Académie Française with our own proper pack. This permission, we feel bound to say, was graciously granted, which compels us here to give a public contradiction to the slanderers who pretend that we live under a government but moderately indulgent to men of letters. Now, this is the first part of this precious manuscript which we offer to our readers restoring it to the title which belongs to it, and entering into an engagement 
that if, of which we have no doubt, this first part should obtain the success it merits. We will publish the second immediately. In the meanwhile, as the godfather is a second father, we beg the reader to lay to our account, and not to that of the Comte la Faire, the pleasure, or the ennui, he may experience. This being understood, let us proceed with our history. End of the Author's Preface The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas Chapter One: The Three Presents of D'Artagnan the Elder On the first Monday of the month of April, 1625, the market town of Meung, in which the author of Romance of the Rose was born, appeared to be in as perfect a state of revolution as if the Huguenots had just made a second La Rochelle of it. Many citizens, seeing the women flying toward the high street, leaving their children crying at the open doors, hastened to don the cuirass, and supporting their somewhat uncertain courage with a musket or a partisan, directed their steps toward the hostelry of the jolly miller, before which was gathered, increasing every minute, a compact group, vociferous and full of curiosity. In those times panics were common and few days passed without some city or other registering in its archives an event of this kind. There were nobles who made war against each other. There was the king, who made war against the cardinal. There was Spain, which made war against the king. Then, in addition to these concealed or public, secret or open wars, there were robbers, mendicants, Huguenots, wolves, and scoundrels, who made war upon everybody. The citizens always took up arms readily against thieves, wolves, or scoundrels, often against nobles or Huguenots, sometimes against the king, but never against Cardinal or Spain. It resulted then from this habit that on the said first Monday of April, 1625, the citizens, on hearing the clamour, and seeing neither the red and yellow standard nor the livery of the Duc de Richelieu, rushed towards the hostel of the Jolly Miller. When arrived there, the cause of the hubbub was apparent to all. A young man, we can sketch his portrait at a dash. Imagine to yourself a Don Quixote of eighteen, a Don Quixote without his corslet, without his coat of mail, without his cuisses, a Don Quixote clothed in a woollen doublet, the blue colour of which had faded into a nameless shade between lees of wine and a heavenly azure face long and brown, high cheekbones, a sign of sagacity, the maxillary muscles enormously developed, an infallible sign by which a Gascon may always be detected, even without his cap, and our young man wore a cap, set off with a sort of feather, the eye open and intelligent, the nose hooked but finely chiselled, too big for a youth, too small for a grown man, an experienced eye might have taken him for a farmer's son upon a journey, had it not been for the long sword which, dangling from a leather baldric, hit against the calves of its owner as he walked, and against the rough side of his steed when he was on horseback. For our young man had a steed which was the observed of all observers. It was a barren pony, from twelve to fourteen years old, yellow in its hide, without a hair in its tail, but not without wind galls on his legs, which, though going with his head lower than his knees, rendering a martingale quite unnecessary, contrived nevertheless to perform his eight leagues a day. Unfortunately, the qualities of this horse were so well concealed under his strange-coloured hide and his unaccountable gait, that at a time when everybody was a connoisseur in horse-flesh, the appearance of the aforesaid pony at Meung, which place he had entered about a quarter of an hour before, by the gate of Beaugency, produced an unfavourable feeling, which extended to his rider. And this feeling had been more painfully perceived by young D'Artagnan, for so was the Don Quixote of this second Rosinante named, from his not being able to conceal from himself the ridiculous appearance that such a steed gave him good horseman as he was. 
He had sighed deeply, therefore, when accepting the gift of the pony from Monsieur d'Artagnan the Elder. He was not ignorant that such a beast was worth at least twenty livres, and the words which had accompanied the present were above all price. "'My son,' said the old Gascon gentleman, in that pure bairn patois of which Henry the Fourth could never rid himself, "'this horse was born in the house of your father about thirteen years ago, and has remained in it ever since, which ought to make you love it. Never sell it. Allow it to die tranquilly and honorably of old age, and if you make a campaign with it, take as much care of it as you would of an old servant. At court, provided you have ever the honor to go there, continued Monsieur d'Artagnan the Elder, an honor to which, remember, your ancient nobility gives you the right. Sustain worthily your name of gentleman, which has been worthily borne by your ancestors for five hundred years, both for your own sake and the sake of those who belong to you. By the latter I mean your relatives and friends. Endure nothing from any one except Monsieur the Cardinal and the King. It is by his courage, please observe, by his courage alone, that a gentleman can make his way nowadays. Whoever hesitates for a second perhaps allows the bait to escape which during that exact second fortune held out to him. You are young. You ought to be brave for two reasons. The first is that you are a Gascon, and the second is that you are my son. Never fear quarrels, but seek adventures. I have taught you how to handle a sword. You have thews of iron, a wrist of steel. Fight on all occasions. Fight the more for duels being forbidden, since consequently there is twice as much courage in fighting. I have nothing to give you, my son, but fifteen crowns, my horse, and the counsels you have just heard. Your mother will add to them a recipe for a certain balsam, which she had from a bohemian, and which has the miraculous virtue of curing all wounds that do not reach the heart. Take advantage of all, and live happily and long. I have but one word to add, and that is to propose an example to you. Not mine, for I myself have never appeared at court, and have only taken part in religious wars as a volunteer. I speak of Monsieur de Treville, who was formerly my neighbor, and who had the honor to be, as a child, the playfellow of our king, Louis the Thirteenth, whom God preserve. Sometimes their play degenerated into battles, and in these battles the king was not always the stronger. The blows which he received increased greatly his esteem and friendship for Monsieur de Treville. Afterward, Monsieur de Treville fought with others. In his first journey to Paris, five times, from the death of the late king till the young one came of age, without reckoning wars and sieges, seven times, and from that date up to the present day, a hundred times, perhaps so that, in spite of edicts, ordinances, and decrees, there he is, captain of the musketeers, that is to say, chief of a legion of Caesars, whom the king holds in great esteem, and whom the cardinal dreads, he who dreads nothing, as it is said. Still further, Monsieur de Treville gains ten thousand crowns a year. He is therefore a great noble." He began as you begin. Go to him with this letter, and make him your model in order that you may do as he has done. Upon which Monsieur d'Artagnan the Elder girded his own sword round his son, kissed him tenderly on both cheeks, and gave him his benediction. On leaving the paternal chamber, the young man found his mother, who was waiting for him with the famous recipe of which the counsels we have just repeated would necessitate frequent employment. 
The adieux were on this side longer and more tender than they had been on the other. Not that M. d'Artagnan did not love his son, who was his only offspring. But M. d'Artagnan was a man, and he would have considered it unworthy of a man to give away to his feelings. Whereas Madame d'Artagnan was a woman, and still more, a mother. She wept abundantly, and— let us speak it to the praise of Monsieur d'Artagnan the Younger. Notwithstanding the efforts he made to remain firm, as a future musketeer ought, nature prevailed, and he shed many tears, of which he succumbed with great difficulty in concealing the half. The same day the young man set forward on his journey, furnished with the three paternal gifts, which consisted, as we have said, of fifteen crowns, the horse, and the letter from Monsieur de Treville the counsels being thrown into the bargain. With such a vade mecum, D'Artagnan was morally and physically an exact copy of the hero of Cervantes, to whom we so happily compared him when our duty of an historian placed us under the necessity of sketching his portrait. Don Quixote took windmills for giants, and sheep for armies. D'Artagnan took every smile for an insult, and every look as a provocation, whence it resulted that from Tarbes to Myung his fist was constantly doubled, or his hand on the hilt of his sword, and yet the fist did not descend upon any jaw, nor did the sword issue from its scabbard. It was not that the sight of the wretched pony did not excite numerous smiles on the countenances of passers-by, but as against the side of this pony rattled a sword of respectable length, and as over this sword gleamed an eye rather ferocious than haughty. These passers-by repressed their hilarity, or, if hilarity prevailed over prudence, they endeavoured to laugh only on one side, like the masks of the ancients. D'Artagnan then remained majestic and intact in his susceptibility, till he came to this unlucky city of Myung. But there, as he was alighting from his horse at the gate of the Jolly Miller, without any one, host, waiter, or hostler, coming to hold his stirrup or take his horse, D'Artagnan spied, through an open window on the ground floor, a gentleman, well made and of good carriage, although of rather a stern countenance, talking with two persons who appeared to listen to him with respect. D'Artagnan fancied quite naturally, according to his custom, that he must be the object of their conversation, and listened. This time D'Artagnan was only in part mistaken. He himself was not in question, but his horse was. The gentleman appeared to be enumerating all his qualities to his auditors, and, as I have said, the auditors seemed to have great deference for the narrator. They every moment burst into fits of laughter. Now, as a half-smile was sufficient to awaken the irascibility of the young man, the effect produced upon him by this vociferous mirth may be easily imagined. Nevertheless, D'Artagnan was desirous of examining the appearance of this impertinent personage who ridiculed him. He fixed his haughty eye upon the stranger, and perceived a man of from forty to forty-five years of age, with black and piercing eyes, pale complexion, a strongly marked nose, and a black and well-shaped moustache. He was dressed in a doublet and hose of a violet color, with aiguillettes of the same color, without any other ornaments than the customary slashes through which the shirt appeared. This doublet and hose, though new, were creased, like travelling clothes for a long time packed in a portmanteau. D'Artagnan made all these remarks with the rapidity of a most minute observer, and doubtless from an instinctive feeling that this stranger was destined to have a great influence over his future life. Now, as at the moment in which D'Artagnan fixed his eyes upon the gentleman in the violet doublet, the gentleman made one of his most knowing and profound remarks respecting the Bayonneer's pony. His two auditors laughed even louder than before, and he himself, though contrary to his custom, allowed a pale smile if I may be allowed to use such an expression, to stray over his countenance. This time, there could be no doubt, D'Artagnan was really insulted. Full, then, of this conviction, 
he pulled his cap down over his eyes, and endeavouring to copy some of the court airs he had picked up in Gascony among young travelling nobles, he advanced with one hand on the hilt of his sword, and the other resting on his hip. Unfortunately, as he advanced, his anger increased at every step, and instead of the proper and lofty speech he had prepared as a prelude to his challenge, he found nothing at the tip of his tongue but a gross personality which he accompanied with a furious gesture. "'I say, sir, you, sir, who are hiding yourself behind that shutter, yes, you, sir, tell me what you are laughing at, and we will laugh together.' The gentleman raised his eyes slowly from the nag to his cavalier, as if he required some time to ascertain whether it could be to him that such strange reproaches were addressed. Then, when he could not possibly entertain any doubt of the matter, his eyebrows slightly bent, and with an accent of irony and insolence impossible to be described, he replied to D'Artagnan, "'I was not speaking to you, sir.' "'But I am speaking to you,' replied the young man, additionally exasperated with this mixture of insolence and good manners, of politeness and scorn. The stranger looked at him again with a slight smile, and, retiring from the window, came out of the hostelry with a slow step, and placed himself before the horse, within two paces of D'Artagnan. His quiet manner and the ironical expression of his countenance redoubled the mirth of the persons with whom he had been talking, and who still remained at the window. D'Artagnan, seeing him approach, drew his sword a foot out of the scabbard. "'This horse is decidedly, or rather has been in his youth, a buttercup,' resumed the stranger, continuing the remarks he had begun, and addressing himself to his auditors at the window, without paying the least attention to the exasperation of D'Artagnan, who, however, placed himself between him and them. "'It is a colour very well known in botany, but till the present time very rare among horses. "'There are people who laugh at the horse that would not dare to laugh at the master,' cried the young emulator of the furious Treville. "'I do not often laugh, sir,' replied the stranger, "'as you may perceive by the expression of my countenance, but nevertheless I retain the privilege of laughing when I please.' "'And I,' cried D'Artagnan, "'will allow no man to laugh when it displeases me.' "'Indeed, sir,' continued the stranger, more calm than ever, "'well, that is perfectly right.' and turning on his heel, was about to re-enter the hostelry by the front gate, beneath which D'Artagnan on arriving had observed a saddled horse. But D'Artagnan was not of a character to allow a man to escape him thus who had the insolence to ridicule him. He drew his sword entirely from the scabbard, and followed him, crying, "'Turn, turn, Master Joker, lest I strike you behind!' "'Strike me!' said the other, turning on his heels, and surveying the young man with as much astonishment as contempt. "'Why, my good fellow, you must be mad!' Then, in a suppressed tone, as if speaking to himself, "'This is annoying,' continued he. "'What a godsend this would be for His Majesty, who is seeking everywhere for brave fellows to recruit for his musketeers!' He had scarcely finished, when D'Artagnan made such a furious lunge at him, that if he had not sprung nimbly backward it is probable he would have jested for the last time. The stranger, then perceiving that the matter went beyond raillery, drew his sword, saluted his adversary, and seriously placed himself on guard. But at the same moment his two auditors, accompanied by the host, fell upon D'Artagnan with sticks, shovels, and tongs. This caused so rapid and complete a diversion from the attack that D'Artagnan's adversary, while the latter turned round to face this shower of blows, sheathed his sword with the same precision, and instead of an actor, which he had nearly been, became a spectator of the fight, a part in which he acquitted himself with his usual impassiveness, muttering nevertheless, A plague upon these Gascons! Replace him on his orange horse, and let him be gone!' "'Not before I have killed you, poltroon!'
cried D'Artagnan, making the best face possible, and never retreating one step before his three assailants, who continued to shower blows upon him. "'Another Gasconade,' murmured the gentleman. "'By my honour, these Gascons are incorrigible. Keep up the dance, then, since he will have it so. When he is tired, he will perhaps tell us that he has had enough of it.' but the stranger knew not the headstrong personage he had to do with. D'Artagnan was not the man ever to cry for quarter. The fight was therefore prolonged for some seconds, but at length D'Artagnan dropped his sword, which was broken in two pieces by the blow of a stick. Another blow full upon his forehead at the same moment brought him to the ground, covered with blood and almost fainting. It was at this moment that people came flocking to the scene of action from all sides. The host, fearful of consequences, with the help of his servants carried the wounded man into the kitchen, where some trifling attentions were bestowed upon him. As to the gentleman, he resumed his place at the window, and surveyed the crowd with a certain impatience, evidently annoyed by their remaining undispersed. "'Well, how is it with this madman?' exclaimed he, turning round as the noise of the door announced the entrance of the host who came in to inquire if he was unhurt. "'Your Excellency is safe and sound?' asked the host. "'Oh, yes, perfectly safe and sound, my good host, and I wish to know what has become of our young man.' "'He is better,' said the host. "'He fainted quite away.' "'Indeed,' said the gentleman. "'But before he fainted he collected all his strength to challenge you, and to defy you while challenging you.' "'Why, this fellow must be the devil in person!' cried the stranger. "'Oh, no, Your Excellency, he is not the devil,' replied the host, with a grin of contempt. "'For during his fainting we rummaged his valise, and found nothing but a clean shirt and eleven crowns, which, however, did not prevent his saying, as he was fainting, that if such a thing had happened in Paris you should have caused to repent of it at a later period.' "'Then,' said the stranger coolly, he must be some prince in disguise. "'I have told you this, good sir,' resumed the host, "'in order that you may be on your guard.' "'Did he name no one in his passion?' "'Yes, he struck his pocket and said, "'We shall see what Monsieur de Treville will think of this insult "'offered to his protégé.' "'Monsieur de Treville,' said the stranger, becoming attentive, he put his hand upon his pocket while pronouncing the name of Monsieur de Treville. Now, my dear host, while your young man was insensible, you did not fail, I am quite sure, to ascertain what that pocket contained, what was there in it. A letter addressed to Monsieur de Treville, captain of the musketeers. Indeed! Exactly as I have the honour to tell your Excellency. The host, who was not endowed with great perspicacity, did not observe the expression which his words had given to the physiognomy of the stranger. The latter rose from the front of the window, upon the sill of which he had leaned with his elbow, and knitted his brow like a man disquieted. "'The devil!' murmured he, between his teeth. "'Can Treville have set this Gascon upon me? He is very young.' but a sword-thrust is a sword-thrust, whatever be the age of him who gives it, and a youth is less to be suspected than an older man. And the stranger fell into a reverie which lasted some minutes. A weak obstacle is sometimes sufficient to overthrow a great design. Host, said he, could you not contrive to get rid of this frantic boy for me? In conscience I cannot kill him, and yet, added he with a coldly menacing expression. He annoys me. Where is he? In my wife's chamber, on the first flight, where they are dressing his wounds. His things and his bag are with him? Has he taken off his doublet? On the contrary, everything is in the kitchen. But if he annoys you, this young fool, to be sure he does. He causes a disturbance in your hostelry which respectable people cannot put up with. Go, make out my bill, and notify my servant. What, monsieur, will you leave us so soon? You know that very well, as I gave my order to saddle my horse. 
Have they not obeyed me? It is done, as your excellency may have observed. Your horse is in the great gateway, already saddled for your departure. That is well. Do as I have directed you, then. What the devil, said the host to himself, can he be afraid of this boy? But an imperious glance from the stranger stopped him short. He bowed humbly and retired. It is not necessary for Milady to be seen by this fellow, continued the stranger. Now, here a footnote. We are well aware that this term, Milady, is only properly used when followed by a family name. But we find it thus in the manuscript, and we do not choose to take upon ourselves to alter it. End of the footnote. She will soon pass. She is already late. I had better get on horseback and go and meet her. I should like, however, to know what this letter addressed to Treville contains. And the stranger, muttering to himself, directed his steps toward the kitchen. In the meantime the host, who entertained no doubt that it was the presence of the young man that drove the stranger from his hostelry, reascended to his wife's chamber, and found D'Artagnan just recovering his senses, giving him to understand that the police would deal with him pretty severely for having sought a quarrel with a great lord, for the opinion of the host the stranger could be nothing less than a great lord. He insisted that, notwithstanding his weakness, D'Artagnan should get up and depart as quickly as possible. D'Artagnan, half stupefied, without his doublet, and with his head bound up in a linen cloth, arose then, and urged by the host, began to descend the stairs. But on arriving at the kitchen, the first thing he saw was his antagonist talking calmly at the step of a heavy carriage, drawn by two large Norman horses. His interlocutor, whose head appeared through the carriage window, was a woman of from twenty to two and twenty years. We have already observed with what rapidity D'Artagnan sees the expression of a countenance. He perceived then, at a glance, that this woman was young and beautiful, and her style of beauty struck him more forcibly from its being totally different from that of the southern countries in which D'Artagnan had hitherto resided. She was pale and fair, with long curls falling in profusion over her shoulders had large blue languishing eyes, rosy lips, and hands of alabaster. She was talking with great animation with the stranger. "'His eminence then orders me,' said the lady, "'to return instantly to London, and to inform him as soon as the Duke leaves London.' "'And as to my other instructions?' asked the fair traveller. "'They are contained in this box.' which you will not open until you are on the other side of the channel. Very well. And you? What will you do? I. I return to Paris. What? Without chastising this insolent boy? asked the lady. The stranger was about to reply, but at the moment he opened his mouth, D'Artagnan, who had heard all, precipitated himself over the threshold of the door. "'This insolent boy chastises others,' cried he, "'and I hope that this time he whom he ought to chastise "'will not escape him as before.' "'Will not escape him,' replied the stranger, knitting his brow. "'No, before a woman you would not dare fly, I presume.' "'Remember,' said Milady, seeing the stranger lay his hand on his sword, "'the least delay may ruin everything.' "'You are right,' cried the gentleman. Be gone, then, on your part, and I will depart as quickly on mine. And bowing to the lady, sprang into his saddle, while her coachman applied his whip vigorously to his horses. The two interlocutors thus separated, taking opposite directions, at full gallop. "'Pay him, booby!' cried the stranger to his servant, without checking the speed of his horse, and the man, after throwing two or three silver pieces at the foot of mine host, galloped after his master." "'Base coward! False gentleman!' cried D'Artagnan, springing forward, in his turn, after the servant. But his wound had rendered him too weak to support such an exertion. Scarcely had he gone ten steps when his ears began to tingle. A faintness seized him, a cloud of blood passed over his eyes, and he fell in the middle of the street, crying still, 
Coward, coward, coward! He is coward indeed, grumbled the host, drawing near to D'Artagnan, and endeavoring by this little flattery to make up matters with the young man, as the heron of the fable did with the snail he had despised the evening before. Yes, a base coward, murmured D'Artagnan, but she, she was very beautiful. What she? demanded the host. Milady, faltered D'Artagnan, and fainted a second time. Ah, it's all one, said the host. I've lost two customers, but this one remains, of whom I am pretty certain for some days to come. There will be eleven crowns gained. It is to remember that eleven crowns was just the sum that remained in D'Artagnan's purse. The host had reckoned upon eleven days of confinement at a crown a day, but he had reckoned without his guest. On the following morning at five o'clock D'Artagnan arose, and, descending to the kitchen without help, asked, among other ingredients, the list of which has not come down to us, for some oil, some wine, and some rosemary, and with his mother's recipe in his hand composed a balsam, with which he anointed his numerous wounds, replacing his bandages himself and positively refusing the assistance of any doctor, D'Artagnan walked about that same evening, and was almost cured by the morrow. But when the time came to pay for his rosemary, this oil, and the wine, the only expense the master had incurred, as he had preserved a strict abstinence, while on the contrary the yellow horse, by the account of the hostler at least, had eaten three times as much as a horse of his size could reasonably suppose to have done. D'Artagnan found nothing in his pocket but his little old velvet purse with the eleven crowns it contained, for as to the letter addressed to Monsieur de Treville, it had disappeared. The young man commenced his search for the letter with the greatest patience, turning out his pockets of all kinds over and over again, rummaging and re-rummaging in his valise, and opening and reopening his purse, but when he found that he had come to the conviction that the letter was not to be found, he flew for the third time into such a rage as was near costing him a fresh consumption of wine, oil, and rosemary, for upon seeing this hot-headed youth become exasperated and threatened to destroy everything in the establishment if his letter was not found, the host seized a spit, his wife a broom-handle, and the servants the same sticks they had used the day before. "'My letter of recommendation!' cried D'Artagnan. "'My letter of recommendation! Or the holy blood I will spit you all like ortolans!' Unfortunately, there was one circumstance which created a powerful obstacle to the accomplishment of this threat, which was, as we have related, that his sword had been in his first conflict broken in two, and which he had entirely forgotten. Hence it resulted when D'Artagnan proceeded to draw his sword in earnest, he found himself purely and simply armed with a stump of a sword about eight or ten inches in length, which the host had carefully placed in the scabbard. As to the rest of the blade, the master had slyly put that on one side, to make himself a larding-pin. But this deception would probably not have stopped our fiery young man if the host had not reflected that the reclamation which his guest made was perfectly just. "'But after all,' said he, lowering the point of his spit, "'where is this letter?' "'Yes, where is this letter?' cried D'Artagnan. "'In the first place I warn you that that letter is for Monsieur de Treville, and it must be found. He will know how to find it.' His threat completed the intimidation of the host. After the king and the cardinal, Monsieur de Treville was the man whose name was perhaps most frequently repeated by the military and even by citizens. There was, to be sure, Father Joseph, but his name was never pronounced but with a subdued voice, such was the terror inspired by his grey eminence, as the cardinal's familiar was called. Throwing down his spit, and ordering his wife to do the same with her broom-handle, and the servants with their sticks, he set the first example of commencing an earnest search for the lost letter. "'Does the letter contain anything valuable?' demanded the host, after a few minutes of useless investigation. "'Zounds! I think it does indeed!' cried the Gascon, who had reckoned upon this letter for making his way at court. "'It contained my fortune!' 
"'Bills upon Spain?' asked the disturbed host. "'Bills upon His Majesty's private treasury,' answered D'Artagnan, who, reckoning upon entering into the king's service in consequence of this recommendation, believed he could make this somewhat hazardous reply without telling of a falsehood. "'The devil!' cried the host at his wit's end. "'But it's of no importance,' continued D'Artagnan, with natural assurance. "'It's of no importance. The money is nothing. That letter was everything. I would rather have lost a thousand pistoles than have lost it.' He would not have risked more if he had said twenty thousand, but a certain juvenile modesty restrained him. A ray of light all at once broke upon the mind of the host as he was giving himself to the devil upon finding nothing. "'That letter is not lost!' cried he. "'What?' cried D'Artagnan. "'No, it has been stolen from you.' "'Stolen! By whom?' by the gentleman who was here yesterday he came down into the kitchen where your doublet was he remained there some time alone i would lay a wager he has stolen it do you think so answered d'artagnan but little convinced as he knew better than any one else how entirely personal the value of this letter was and was nothing in it likely to tempt cupidity the fact was that none of his servants none of the travellers present could have gained anything by being possessed of this paper. "'Do you say,' resumed D'Artagnan, "'that you suspect that impertinent gentleman?' "'I tell you I am sure of it,' continued the host. "'When I informed him that your lordship was the protégé of Monsieur de Treville, and that you even had a letter for that illustrious gentleman, he appeared to be very much disturbed, and asked me where that letter was.' and immediately came down into the kitchen, where he knew your doublet was. "'Then that's my thief,' replied D'Artagnan. "'I will complain to Monsieur de Treville, and Monsieur de Treville will complain to the King.' He then drew two crowns majestically from his purse, and gave them to the host, who accompanied him, cap in hand, to the gate, and remounted his yellow horse, which bore him without any further accident to the gate of Saint-Antoine at Paris where his owner sold him for three crowns, which was a very good price, considering that D'Artagnan had ridden him hard during the last stage. Thus the dealer to whom D'Artagnan sold him for the nine lever did not conceal from the young man that he only gave that enormous sum for him on the account of the originality of his color. Thus D'Artagnan entered Paris on foot, carrying his little packet under his arm, and walked about till he found an apartment to be let on terms suited to the scantiness of his means. This chamber was a sort of garret, situated in the Rue des Fessoyeurs, near the Luxembourg. As soon as the earnest money was paid, D'Artagnan took possession of his lodging, and passed the remainder of the day in sewing on to his doublet and hose some ornamental braiding which his mother had taken off an almost new doublet of the elder Monsieur D'Artagnan and which she had given her son secretly. Next he went to the Quai de Ferraille to have a new blade put to his sword, and then returned toward the Louvre, inquiring of the first musketeer he met for the situation of the Hotel of Monsieur de Treville, which proved to be in the Rue de Vieux Colombier, that is to say, in the immediate vicinity of the chamber hired by D'Artagnan, a circumstance which appeared to furnish a happy augury for the success of his journey. After this, satisfied with the way in which he had conducted himself at Meung, without remorse for the past, confident in the present, and full of hope for the future, he retired to bed and slept the sleep of the brave. This sleep, provincial as it was, brought him to nine o'clock in the morning, at which hour he rose, in order to repair to the residence of Monsieur de Treville, the third personage in the kingdom, in the paternal estimation. End of chapter The Three Musketeers by Alexander Dumas Chapter 2 the antechamber of Monsieur de Treville. Monsieur de Troisville, as his family was still called in Gascony, 
or Monsieur de Treville, as he has ended by styling himself in Paris, had really commenced life as D'Artagnan now did, that is to say, without a sou in his pocket, but with a fund of audacity, shrewdness, and intelligence which makes the poorest Gascon gentleman often derive more in his hope from the paternal inheritance than the richest Perigordian or Barrican gentleman derives in reality from his. His insolent bravery, his still more insolent success at a time when blows poured down like hail, had borne him to the top of that difficult ladder called court favor, which he had climbed four steps at a time. He was the friend of the king, who honored highly, as every one knows, the memory of his father, Henry the Fourth. The father of Monsieur de Treville had served him so faithfully in his wars against the League that in default of money, a thing to which the Baroness was accustomed all his life, and who constantly paid his debts with that of which he never stood in need of borrowing, that is to say, with ready wit, in default of money, we repeat, he authorized him, after the reduction of Paris, to assume for his arms a golden lion passant upon gules, with the motto, Fidelis et Fortis. This was a great matter in the way of honour, but very little in the way of wealth, so that when the illustrious companion of the great Henry died, the only inheritance he was able to leave his son was his sword and his motto. Thanks to this double gift, and the spotless name that accompanied it, Monsieur de Treville was admitted into the household of the young prince where he made such good use of his sword, and was so faithful to his motto, that Louis the Thirteenth, one of the good blades of his kingdom, was accustomed to say that if he had a friend who was about to fight, he would advise him to choose as a second, himself first, and Treville next, or even perhaps before himself. Thus Louis the Thirteenth had a real liking for Treville, a royal liking, a self-interested liking, it is true, but still a liking. At that unhappy period it was an important consideration to be surrounded by such men as Treville. Many might take for their device the epithet strong, which formed the second part of his motto, but very few gentlemen could lay claim to the faithful, which constituted the first. Treville was one of these latter. His was one of those rare organizations endowed with an obedient intelligence like that of the dog, with a blind valor, a quick eye, and a prompt hand, to whom sight appeared only to be given to see if the king was dissatisfied with any one, and the hand to strike this displeasing personage, whether a Besme, a Morever, a Potiotomer, or a Vitry. In short, up to this period nothing had been wanting to Treville but opportunity, but he was ever on the watch for it and he faithfully promised himself that he would not fail to seize it by its three hairs whenever it came within reach of his hand. At last Louis the Thirteenth made Treville the captain of his musketeers, who were to Louis the Thirteenth in devotedness, or rather in fanaticism, what his ordinaries had been to Henry the Third, and his Scotch guard to Louis the Eleventh. On his part, the cardinal was not behind the king in this respect. When he saw the formidable and chosen body with which Louis the Thirteenth had surrounded himself, this second, or rather this first king of France, became desirous that he too should have his guard. He had his musketeers, therefore, as Louis the Thirteenth had his, and these two powerful rivals vied with each other in procuring not only from all the provinces of France, but even from all foreign states, the most celebrated swordsmen. It was not uncommon for Richelieu and Louis the Thirteenth to dispute over their evening game of chess upon the merits of their servants. Each boasted the bearing and the courage of his own people. While exclaiming loudly against duels and brawls, they excited them secretly to quarrel deriving an immoderate satisfaction, or genuine regret, from the success or defeat of their own combatants. We learn this from the memoirs of a man who was concerned in some few of these defeats, and in many of these victories. 
Treville had grasped the weak side of his master, and it was to this address that he owed the long and constant favour of a king who has not left the reputation behind him of being very faithful in his friendships. He paraded his musketeers before the Cardinal Armand du Plessis with an insolent air which made the grey moustache of his eminence curl with ire. Treville understood admirably the war method of that period, in which he, who could not live at the expense of the enemy, must live at the expense of his compatriots. His soldiers formed a legion of devil-may-care fellows, perfectly undisciplined toward all but himself. Loose, half-drunk, imposing, the king's musketeers, or rather Monsieur de Treville's, spread themselves about in the cabarets, in the public walks, and the public sports, shouting, twisting their moustaches, clanking their swords, and taking great pleasure in annoying the guards of the cardinal whenever they could fall in with them. Then, drawing in the open streets, as if it were the best of all possible sports, sometimes killed, but sure in that case to be both wept and avenged, often killing others, but then certain of not rotting in prison, Monsieur de Treville being there to claim them. Thus Monsieur de Treville was praised to the highest note by these men, who adored him, and who, ruffians as they were, trembled before him like scholars before their master, obedient to his least word, and ready to sacrifice themselves to wash out the smallest insult. Monsieur de Treville employed this powerful weapon for the king in the first place, and the friends of the king, and then for himself and his own friends. For the rest, in the memoirs of this period, which have left so many memoirs, one does not find this worthy gentleman blamed even by his enemies, and he had many such among men of the pen as well as among men of the sword. In no instance, let us say, was this worthy gentleman accused of deriving personal advantage from the cooperation of his minions. Endowed with a rare genius for intrigue, which rendered him the equal of the ablest intriguers, he remained an honest man. Still further, in spite of sword thrusts which weaken, and painful exercises which fatigue, he had become one of the most gallant frequenters of revels, one of the most insinuating ladies' men, one of the softest whisperers of interesting nothings of his day. The bonne fortune of de Treville were talked of as those of Monsieur de Bassompierre had been talked of twenty years before, and that was not saying a little. The captain of the musketeers was therefore admired, feared, and loved, and this constitutes the zenith of human fortune. Louis the Fourteenth absorbed all the smaller stars of his court in his own vast radiance, but his father, a son pluribus impar, left his personal splendor to each of his favorites his individual value to each of his courtiers. In addition to the leaves of the king and the cardinal, there might be reckoned in Paris at that time more than two hundred smaller but still noteworthy leaves. Among these two hundred leaves that of Treville was one of the most sought. The court of his hotel, situated in the Rue de Vieux Colombier, resembled a camp from by six o'clock in the morning in summer and eight o'clock in winter. From fifty to sixty musketeers, who appeared to replace one another in order always to present an imposing number, paraded constantly, armed to the teeth and ready for anything. On one of these immense staircases, upon whose space modern civilizations would build a whole house, ascended and descended the office-seekers of Paris who ran after any sort of favor, gentlemen from the provinces anxious to be enrolled, and servants in all sorts of liveries bringing and carrying messages between their masters and Monsieur de Treville. In the antechamber, upon long circular benches, reposed the elect, that is to say, those who were called. In this apartment a continued buzzing prevailed from morning till night while M. de Treville, in his office contiguous to this antechamber, received visits, listened to complaints, gave his orders, 
and like the king in his balcony at the Louvre, had only to place himself at the window to review both his men and arms. The day on which D'Artagnan presented himself the assemblage was imposing, particularly for a provincial just arriving from his province. It is true that this provincial was a Gascon, and that, particularly at this period, the compatriots of D'Artagnan had the reputation of not being easily intimidated. When he had once passed the massive door covered with long square-headed nails, he fell into the midst of a troop of swordsmen, who crossed one another in their passage, calling out, quarrelling, and playing tricks one with another. In order to make one's way amid these turbulent and conflicting waves, it was necessary to be an officer, a great noble, or a pretty woman. It was then, into the midst of this tumult and disorder, that our young man advanced with a beating heat, ranging his long rapier up his lanky leg, and keeping one hand on the edge of his cap, with that half-smile of the embarrassed, a provincial who wishes to put on a good face. When he had passed one group he began to breathe more freely, but he could not help observing that they turned round to look at him, and for the first time in his life D'Artagnan, who had till that day entertained a very good opinion of himself, felt ridiculous. Arrived at the staircase it was still worse. There were four musketeers on the bottom steps, amusing themselves with the following exercise, while ten or twelve of their comrades waited upon the landing-place to take their turn in the sport. One of them, stationed upon the top stair, naked sword in hand, prevented, or at least endeavoured to prevent, the three others from ascending. These three others fenced against him with their agile swords. D'Artagnan at first took these weapons for foils, and believed them to be buttoned, but he soon perceived by certain scratches that every weapon was pointed and sharpened, and that at each of these scratches not only the spectators, but even the actors themselves laughed like so many madmen. He who at the moment occupied the upper step kept his adversaries marvellously in check. A circle was formed around them. The conditions required that at every hit the man touched should quit the game, yielding his turn for the benefit of the adversary who had hit him. In five minutes three were slightly wounded, one on the hand, another on the ear, by the defender of the stair, who himself remained intact, a piece of skill which was worth to him, according to the rules agreed upon, three turns a favour. However difficult it might be, or rather as he pretended it was, to astonish our young traveller, this pastime really astonished him. He had seen in his province, that land in which heads became so easily heated, a few of the preliminaries of duels, but the daring of these four fencers appeared to him the strongest he had ever heard of even in Gascony. He believed himself transported into that famous country of giants into which Gulliver afterward went and was so frightened, and yet he had not gained the goal, for there was still the landing-place and the antechamber. On the landing they were no longer fighting, but amused themselves with stories about women, and in the antechamber with stories about the court. On the landing D'Artagnan blushed, in the antechamber he trembled. His warm and fickle imagination, which in Gascony had rendered formidable to young chambermaids, and even sometimes their mistresses, had never dreamed, even in the moments of delirium, of half the amorous wonders, or a quarter of the feats of gallantry which were here set forth in connection with names the best known, and with details the least concealed. But if his morals were shocked on the landing, his respect for the cardinal was scandalized in the antechamber. There, to his great astonishment, D'Artagnan heard the policy which made all Europe tremble, criticized aloud and openly, as well as the private life of the cardinal, which so many great nobles have been punished for trying to pry into. That great man, who was so revered by D'Artagnan the Elder, served as an object of ridicule to the musketeers of Treville, who cracked their jokes upon his bandy legs and his crooked back. Some sang ballads about Mademoiselle d'Anguillon, his mistress, and Mademoiselle Cambalet, his niece, 
while others form parties and plans to annoy the pages and guards of the cardinal duke all things which appeared to d'artagnan monstrous impossibilities nevertheless when the name of the king was now and then uttered unthinkingly amid all these cardinal jests a sort of gag seemed to close for a moment on all those jeering mouths they looked hesitating around them and appeared to doubt the thickness of the partition between them and the office of monsieur de treville but a fresh allusion soon brought back the conversation to his eminence and then the laughter recovered its loudness and the light was not withheld from any of his actions certes these fellows will all either be imprisoned or hanged thought the terrified d'artagnan and i no doubt with them for from the moment i have either listened to or heard them i shall be held as an accomplice what would my good father say who so strongly pointed out to me the respect due to the cardinal if he knew i was in the society of such pagans we have no need therefore to say that d'artagnan dared not join in the conversation only he looked with all his eyes and listened with all his ears stretching his five senses so as to lose nothing and despite his confidence on the paternal admonitions he felt himself carried by his tastes and led by his instincts to praise rather than to blame the unheard-of things which were taking place although he was a perfect stranger in the court of monsieur de treville's courtiers and this his first appearance in that place he was at length noticed and somebody came and asked him what he wanted at this demand d'artagnan gave his name very modestly emphasized the title of compatriot and begged the servant who had put the question to him to request a moment's audience of monsieur de treville a request which the other with an air of protection promised to transmit in due season d'artagnan a little recovered from his first surprise had now leisure to study costumes and physiognomy the center of the most animated group was a musketeer of great height and haughty countenance dressed in a costume so peculiar as to attract general attention he did not wear the uniform cloak which was not obligatory at that epoch of less liberty but more independence but a cerulean blue doublet a little faded and worn and over this a magnificent baldric worked in gold which shone like water ripples in the sun a long cloak of crimson velvet fell in graceful folds from his shoulders disclosing in front the splendid baldric from which was suspended a gigantic rapier this musketeer had just come off guard complained of having a cold and coughed from time to time affectedly it was for this reason as he said to those around him that he had put on his cloak and while he spoke with a lofty air and twisted his moustache disdainfully all admired his embroidered baldric and d'artagnan more than any one what would you have said the musketeer this fashion is coming in it is a folly i admit but still it is the fashion besides one must lay out one's inheritance somehow ah porthos cried one of his companions don't try to make us believe you obtained that baldric by paternal generosity it was given to you by that veiled lady i met you with the other sunday near the gate st honor no upon honor and by the faith of a gentleman i bought it with the contents of my own purse answered he who they designated by the name porthos yes about in the same manner said another musketeer that i bought this new purse with what my mistress put into the old one it's true though said porthos and the proof is that i paid twelve pistoles for it the wonder was increased though the doubt continued to exist is it not true aramis said porthos turning toward another musketeer this other musketeer formed a perfect contrast to his interrogator who had just designated him by the name of aramis he was a stout man of about two or three and twenty with an open ingenuous countenance a black mild eye and cheeks rosy and downy as an autumn peach 
His delicate moustache marked a perfectly straight line upon his upper lip. He appeared to dread to lower his hands lest their veins should swell, and he pinched the tips of his ears from time to time to preserve their delicate pink transparency. Habitually he spoke little and slowly, bowed frequently, laughed without noise, showing his teeth, which were fine, and which, as the rest of his person, he appeared to take great care. He answered the appeal of his friend by an affirmative nod of the head. This affirmation appeared to dispel all doubts with regard to the baldric. They continued to admire it, but said no more about it, and with a rapid change of thought the conversation passed suddenly to another object. "'What do you think of the story Chalet's Esquire relates?' asked another musketeer, without addressing any one in particular, but on the contrary speaking to everybody. "'And what does he say?' asked Porthos, in a self-sufficient tone. He relates that he met at Brussels Rochefort, the M. Damne of the Cardinal disguised as a Capuchin, and that this cursed Rochefort, thanks to his disguise, had tricked Monsieur de Lague like a ninny as he is. A ninny, indeed, said Porthos. But is the matter certain? I had it from Aramis, replied the musketeer. Indeed! "'Why, you know it, Porthos,' said Aramis. "'I told you of it yesterday. Let us say no more about it.' "'Say no more about it? That's your opinion,' replied Porthos. "'Say no more about it? Peste! You come to your conclusions quickly. What? The cardinal sets a spy upon a gentleman? Has his letters stolen from him by means of a traitor, a brigand?' a rascal has, with the help of this spy, and thanks to this correspondence, Chalet's throat-cut, under the stupid pretext that he wanted to kill the king and marry Monsieur to the Queen. Nobody knew a word of this enigma. You unraveled it yesterday to the great satisfaction of all, and while we are still gaping with wonder at the news, you come and tell us today, let us say no more about it. "'Well, then, let us talk about it, since you desire it,' replied Aramis patiently. "'This Rochefort,' cried Porthos, "'if I were the Esquire of Poor Chalet, should pass a minute or two very uncomfortably with me.' "'And you, you would pass rather a sad quarter-hour with the Red Duke,' replied Aramis. "'Oh, the Red Duke! Bravo, bravo, the Red Duke!' cried Porthos, clapping his hands and nodding his head. "'The Red Duke is capital. I'll circulate that saying, be assured, my dear fellow. Who says this Aramis is not a wit? What a misfortune it is that you do not follow your first vocation! What a delicious abbey you would have made!' "'Oh, it's only a temporary postponement,' replied Aramis. "'I shall be one some day.' You very well know, Porthos, that I continue to study theology for that purpose. He will be one, as he says, cried Porthos. He will be one, sooner or later. Sooner, said Aramis. He only waits for one thing to determine him to resume his cassock, which hangs behind his uniform, said another musketeer. What is he waiting for? asked another. Only till the king has given an heir to the crown of France. No jesting upon that subject, gentlemen, said Porthos. Thank God the queen is still of an age to give one. They say that Monsieur de Buckingham is in France, replied Aramis, with a significant smile which gave to this sentence, apparently so simple, a tolerably scandalous meaning. Aramis, my good friend, this time you are wrong interrupted Porthos. Your wit is always leading you beyond bounds. If Monsieur de Treville heard you, you would repent of speaking thus. "'Are you going to give me a lesson, Porthos?' cried Aramis, from whose usually mild eye a flash passed like lightning. "'My dear fellow, be a musketeer or an abbe, be one or the other, but not both,' replied Porthos. "'You know what Athos told you the other day.' You eat at everybody's mess. 
"'Ah, don't be angry, I beg of you. That would be useless. You know what is agreed upon between you, Athos, and me. You go to Madame of D'Aguillon's, and you pay your court to her. You go to Madame de Bois-Tracy's, the cousin of Madame de Chevreuse, and you pass for being far advanced in the good graces of that lady. Oh, good Lord, don't trouble yourself to reveal your good luck. No one asks for your secret. All the world knows your discretion. But since you possess that virtue, why the devil don't you make use of it with respect to Her Majesty? Let whoever likes talk of the King and the Cardinal, and how he likes. But the Queen is sacred, and if any one speaks of her, let it be respectfully. Porthos, you are as vain as Narcissus, I plainly tell you so, replied Aramis. You know I hate moralizing, except when it is done by Athos. As to you, good sir, you wear too magnificent a baldric to be strong on that head. I will be an abbe if it suits me. In the meanwhile I am a musketeer. In that quality I say what I please, and at this moment it pleases me to say that you weary me. Aramis! Porthos! Gentlemen, gentlemen! cried the surrounding group. Monsieur de Treville awaits Monsieur d'Artagnan, cried a servant, throwing open the door of the cabinet. At this announcement, during which the door remained open, everyone became mute, and amid the general silence the young man crossed part of the length of the antechamber, and entered the apartment of the captain of the musketeers, congratulating himself with all his heart at having so narrowly escaped the end of this strange quarrel. End of chapter.